And first up, the talk, uh, a man who probably needs very little introduction uh, to this audience, because uh, he has been around in the community for quite a long time, and uh, I have worked with him, and that was a pleasure at the time. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Christopher Woods, who's going to talk on solving the long-term maintenance and funding challenge of research software by founding the Open Biosim Community Interest Company. Thank you, Chris. And welcome back. If I didn't scare you away before lunch, um, thank you for coming back. If you didn't have my talk before lunch, then it will be recorded, and hopefully you'll be inspired by this one. Now, this talk, the title is too long. Um, really, the title should have been How You Could Possibly Fund Maintenance on Your Software, for your software. And that's kind of what we tried to do. Because it all comes down to funding, and funding for software development. And there's a key thing to remember with research funding. Research funding follows research need. And there is often a research need for new software. And that means that comparatively, it is easy, comparatively, I'm not saying it is easy, but it's comparatively easy to get research funding for new software to meet a new research need. You can take some time of your existing PhD or your PDRA, get them to write the software. You can bolt some software development onto a grant that's describing this new wonderful thing you want to build and do. And indeed, if it's a big enough research need and there's a software development call, you can apply for a whole grant that will fund the development of your new software. And you get the money, in comes the money, and then you can hire people, researchers, RSCs, whatever, and they beaver away, and they produce software. And if you're really lucky, and the software is good, you can keep the funding going. You can get more money, because you still have this research need you're trying to meet, and that more money could give you more people, and the software can become bigger and better, and life is wonderful, until the money flies away. The funding has run out. The people you employed, well, they're not employed anymore to look after your software. Maybe one of them will be looking after the software in their free time, looking after the issues, the pull requests, fixing it because they really were inspired by the passion you had for this piece of software. But they can't do everything. They can't answer every issue, do the porting, the packaging, and the evenings and weekends, and the software will begin to bit rot. And eventually, even they, with no more money, will leave and the software will bit rot and will become abandoned where? And we see this many times. But the thing is, is when you were there applying for funding, trying to get the stuff done, this was not your plan of what would happen. Your plan was apply for funding step one, step two, write the software, step three, question mark, question mark, step four, profit. And from the profit, you would reach this nirvana of the community software where there's tons of users and loads of money coming in. And isn't it wonderful to be living in this world which you imagine these people running these big community software projects must be leading? But the reality is, is that that's not how community software works. It's not a nirvana. And that's because you must always remember research funding follows research need. There is no research need that's easy to describe to maintain the software, no. The research need is for new features for the software. So that money you get employs new people who bolt their new features onto the community software. And as it continues and grows, you just keep adding on new features with new people and bolting it on, and you create a Jenga tower. Because remember, research funding follows research need. It is hard to express the need for maintenance and fixing technical debt and porting and packaging and managing community contributions. Very difficult to express that. Very difficult to get it funded. And so it's not done, except by people volunteering on the side. And of course, that means that the core of your software will eventually begin to bit rot. And it becomes a Jenga tower. Now, I'm just going to stop here just to make sure that I am not talking from my own personal experience and that there isn't a magic question mark, question mark that somebody else has discovered, hands up if this story sounds any way familiar to you. If this is what your experience of research, software development and maintenance, good, I feel I'm not on my own here. Because this was our experience when we did the Biosim Space Project. We had tons of people going, there's a research need. We want money for this. We will give you money for this. Please create this piece of software called Biosim Space. And that meant we got money to create this new software. We hired two people. 
off they worked producing this wonderful piece of software until the money ran out. When the money ran out, we were left with one RSC working in my group in Bristol who was still passionate about this project and he kept it going doing the issues, bug fixes, responding to people of like, how can I get this working on my computer, blah, 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 blah. He's become the world expert on creating anaconda packages. If you ever want help creating anaconda packages, he knows how to do it. And because of that work, we have people and companies going, who are using the software, going, we want to give you money. Like, we need this to be maintained and used so that we can run it within our companies. Please let us give you money to run this software. And we're like, yeah, good, this is, this is wonderful. I feel the question mark, question mark stage is coming. Please do give us some money. And it looked like, yes, we've got an EPSRC Impact Acceleration Award. The company is going to give us money. And then there were other companies coming in as well going, we want to give you money. This software is wonderful. Please, please take money. But it was 2020. And we hit a roadblock. Now, one of the obstacles we ran into was kind of obvious for 2020. But to be honest, there was a far, far worse obstacle. More annoying, I had, my 2020 was a mixture of sorting out Meta Awards, which was fun, but rather macabre. And then the other half of 2020 was dealing with my nemesis, lawyers. <laughs> lawyers are wonderful, wonderful creatures. <laughs> now, to understand why the lawyers got involved, and they did a good job, I, I, I shouldn't attack them too much. People wanted to give money for this software. The software project was run out of Edinburgh, so they were trying to give money to Edinburgh University. But my RSC, who was the one who was gonna do the work, he was in my group employed at Bristol. And there was a company, and oh my God, company wants to give money, university department, help, there's a company, they want tech transfer, patents, oh my God, oh my God. No, they just want support. Everything's open source, calm down. Like, and they didn't understand that, that it was like a company was giving you money for nothing in return. And it was like, because they want us to support the software, honestly. So we thought it was just gonna be easy. Like, you know, we've got the RSE down in Bristol. Edinburgh's gonna have the money. We just second the RSE to Edinburgh. Like, that's not difficult, surely. Like, why would that be difficult? You know, we all employ people. It's just a postdoc contract. No. Oh my God, a six page secondment agreement between the University of Bristol and the University of Edinburgh, which basically had to be worked out to say that the whole seconding process, you know, Edinburgh are not allowed to poach the RSC at the end of the project because they might like him and steal him, that you must not do that for one year. You know, Edinburgh can like, you know, tell the RSC off, but they can't discipline him. Only Bristol can discipline him blah, 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 like loads of legal stuff. Oh my goodness, intellectual property, no subcontracting. They can't secretly use him on other projects. Like, you know, we're all one university community in the UK, but talking to the lawyers, you'd think we're all trying to get each other. And then you have the collaboration agreement, 15 pages to describe the collaboration between the universities of Bristol, Edinburgh and the company. Because two universities, oh my goodness, they have different legal like check transfer teams and that was fun. Um, VAT, publication policies, blah, 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 blah. Bearing in mind, there's no tech transfer. It's an open source project. We're all happy friends who are just like, can we just pay for them to just fix some bugs for us? That's all we want. Oh, it's a painful process. All of that took one year to negotiate. The agreements took 16 legal research development and ancillary staff. <laughs> Oh my goodness, I had the most hideous Zoom meetings you could imagine. And this was for a nine month project employing one RSC. <laughs> work from home meant that the RSC continued to live and work at home near Bristol. They never visited Edinburgh. <laughs> <sighs> but still, and again, it sounds like I'm attacking those 16 staff, they worked their socks off. It's not their fault that the system is so broken. They were wonderful. And they got no money for this. Let's bear in mind, this is a tiny, tiny project. So I am thanking them for their effort for navigating this terrible process. But we developed it, made it even better. 
Indeed, it's now growing so much, like, you know, people are using 125,000 times this software's been used at least because we do tracking, 3,000 downloads, 80 pull requests, 300 issues. This is a proper community piece of code now. And what's more, we have more companies going, please, please, please let us pay you to support and develop it. And we're like, oh dear lawyers. <laughs> but I am a software engineer. And there are two principles of software engineering that I ascribe to, I stick to like anything, and those are wet and dry. Dry, don't repeat yourself, wet, write everything twice. These sound like these are in conflict, but they're not. Don't repeat yourself means basically do it the kind of like, don't do the same thing over and over again, that's madness. Write everything twice when combined with dry means do it the easy way first, or the the straightforward way first, fighting with 16 lawyers, I wouldn't call easy, but that's what we did. And then the second time, that's when you have to do it the second time, that's when you generalize and you create the virtual base class. You know, you abstract out the difficulties. And that's what we decided to do. You know, 2020, I was kind of like, end of 2020, beginning of 2021, I've memories of how we set up the society were fresh in my mind. And I realized that, believe it or not, setting up a society is easier than dealing with 16 lawyers and one collaboration agreement for a nine month project. And so we went down that route. We took the lawyer time, which the university was freely willing to provide because they saw, look, lots of money's coming in, we're happy to help you. And we said to them, instead of doing this for one bespoke contract, instead, could we do the general case? Could we create Open Biosim as a community interest corporation? It's the same amount of legal work it's the same amount of risk, why don't we do this? Now, community interest corporation, company, sorry, can always get the words wrong, community interest company is very easy to set up, believe it or not. It's actually way easier than setting up the society. It's way easier than creating a real company. And it has almost no rules attached to it. It's an extremely agile thing. And one of the nice things about it is it like, has just a simple membership, which we have here, so we have myself. So Gillian Freder is basically chairing it, and we are the members, and the members include the representatives of the companies that want to give us money. And it can hold money, it has a bank account. Not only does it have, can it hold money and have a bank account, it can also enter into legal agreements. It can sign contracts as and of itself, and it can employ people. This is amazing, because now it means we can use this for all the collaborations. Now a community interest company, people go, what is that? And I always get my wording wrong. It is not a charity. If it's a charity, your overheads are high because you've got to meet the charity law. It is not a charity. This can make a profit, but there's an asset lock that forces you to use the profit to benefit the community. So it behaves like a charity. It's like charity light, effectively. It's not a foundation. It's quite similar to a foundation, but it's not a foundation because there's no initial bequeathal of funds. So effectively, it starts with zero, it should end with zero, and it does stuff. There's a whole load of other things you can read from the government if you look at the slides of what it is, how it compares to a charity, how it compares to a company. One of the things I do like, which uh, one of our esteemed industrial members pointed out, is we can get R&D tax credits, which are these wonderful things where they refund you your tax that we haven't paid. And I suddenly realized there's a whole layer of business and government where you get virtual money. And actually, there's, there's a lot that's up there that is like, ooh, interesting. But hey, they're printing money now like anything, so let's join in with that. Now, when you create the company, you have to create the company's mission. And again, this is the virtual base class. We were like, let's create this so it can do everything we need it to do. So we made it as general as possible. The function of the company should be to create and maintain open source software to foster the development of new research and innovation within the UK. I hope that's general enough. You know, that's quite, that, you know, we can do anything basically with this. Now the advantages, or rather the way it operates, we have a governance structure. So again, it's composed of members and not trustees. The members are limited like for one pound liability on them. There's one director who's Julian. The members are myself, Julian, and basically representatives of our community of CCB Biosim, but also representatives of the companies that are doing the first engagements with us. So it means we're all friends together, it's a partnership. They're a member, so if it goes wrong, they're not gonna sue us ultimately, but also they shape it as well. And we have processes to enable the growth of the CIC and to recruit new members. And that's the model we're going to be using, is using the membership to grow the commercial engagements. We have advisors. So actually all has been set up with legal advisors and accountants and everything else, so it was done properly. 
And we have employees. So first employee is signed on. They'll be starting in September. And we have a vacancy for another employee because we've actually got lots of money now. And if you're interested in working for Open Biosim, then please do get in touch with me. We are flexible. You can work at home. You can work part time. We don't have any of the rules that prevent things happening at universities. And of course, we subcon, you know, this is the derived class now. We've sort of specialized the mission. It is to support open source development and maintenance of research software related to biomolecular simulation. Current focus is BiosimSpace, which was the software that was created from the project. But we expand to cover any open source software for which there is open biosim community need. Now, the way it works is companies contract directly with open biosim. The contracts recognize the need for maintenance and support activities explicitly. So effectively, it pays for the maintenance and support. Open Biosim directly employs the RSCs to do the work. And these RSCs can be any kind of employment. Freelancers, they can come from universities by doing sharing with agreements with universities. They can engage in personal consultancy. They can do time sharing, which is how we're doing the first employment. Equally, Open Biosim, because it's like a charity, you can just donate money to it. We have people who just want to go take money. And we're like, well, who? We can take it. Which, you know, if you've worked in university long enough, you realize taking money is really hard. But we can actually take it now, which is great. And it's extremely agile. Now, the advantages of this is that the community who care about the software, who are using the software, now have this direct route to fund its community development, maintenance, and support. Before, they were like, I have 500 pounds. Can I give you 500 pounds for some, just to keep it going? And we're like, there's no way the university can process 500 pounds, go away, sorry. Now it's like, give us 500 pounds, it's fine. We can just put that into the pool, hire more people as we need more people, and that goes to general maintenance and support. But this also aligns with the open source and open science ethos. An explicit part of this is it's a community enterprise, and everything open biosim must do must be open source. We will never engage in anything that is not open source. That's like a red line for the CIC. Equally, it's providing job security and career progression for the RSC who valiantly worked in their free time to keep it going. He was nearing the top of his pay spine, and there's very little else we could do. Now he can move into this CIC and become the head of the RSCs in that CIC. And we pay him more because we can. We're not bound by national university collective pay agreements. And we have a mechanism for the industry to more rapidly and agilely engage with us and engage with open source software. We have had companies come to us and say, we have this open source piece of biomolecular simulation software. It's not biosim space, but could you help us look after it? And we're like, well, yeah, it kind of fits the mission. We're effectively a, almost like a consultancy to do open source biomolecular simulation development. And we're open to that. Other advantages is I actually see this not just being industrial. There's a problem for, uh, for research councils of how do you fund maintenance? How do you know what you should maintain? And what we see is a future where researchers actually put maintenance on their grants, like they put the software licensing on their grants, and they say, I want to pay 500 pounds of maintenance for the piece of software that's vital for my research. Each of those individual researchers, 500 pounds, could come to us. We combine it together and then hire someone to do the work. That is impossible without an entity like Open Biosim to aggregate all of that maintenance funding. And what this would do is it would provide a market-based mechanism for funders to actively direct maintenance and support funds to fund the software that researchers actively use and ask for maintenance for. Researchers will vote for their, with their feet and say, I want to fund maintenance of this thing that I use. So we move from developers of software saying, my software is great, give me money to maintain it, to communities going, we use this software, please can the research councils fund it, collect 500 pounds each, funnel it to us, we do the maintenance. It changes from developer push to community pull. There are disadvantages. It took a long time to put together, but better than spending that time doing yet another collaboration agreement and everything else. University of Edinburgh put a lot of time and money into this. They've really invested in it, and they see the value of it coming out. You know, they've bought out Julianne's time, 20%, to do all of the work for this, and Julianne has been amazing to do that. And they've provided us with their legal team, their startup teams, and the networking with the Edinburgh startups and the Edinburgh charities so we can work out what we can do and actually really have that kind of community. It's risky, but our liability is limited to one pound each. And we have members who represent the people who want the services, so it's a partnership. 
So basically, it's not like the company will say we hate you because they helped create it and they're helping steer it. So it's kind of as much as we can make it work. But of course, your community needs to be a certain size before this is even viable. We need to have the industrial interest to kickstart that initial funding. <coughs> so we're launching. It's already been created. We've had the registration. We've got the domain name, GitHub uh, organization. We've signed the first commercial agreements. And we now have cash flow. And we're now employing our first employee. And I'm advertising soon for another. Again, talk to me if you want to work for something like this. And I think we will grow with the amount of interest we've had. We plan to have our formal launch at the beginning of 2023 to coincide with the major new release of our software. And all I'll say here is please wish us luck and thank you to the wonderful stars of Open Biosim, Lester particularly, who kept the software going and is going to be our new head of RSC within Open Biosim and the members of the company who have just put in all of the work to get this going. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for that, Chris. That was fascinating. Um, and I'm sure it's fascinated some members of the audience who have already put some questions on Slido. So we'll do it the conventional way. We'll start with the, uh, the most upvoted one at the top. Does the university have any concerns about being bypassed in terms of funding, outputs, credit, et cetera? So I would say no, otherwise they wouldn't have helped us do it. So Edinburgh are actually very supportive of this route. And to be honest, it would cost so much with that 16 people to do for one agreement. Those kind of agreements are a cost. The benefit the university gets from software is not so much the money to pay for people to develop it, it's the outputs and the impact and the ref contributions. And they still keep all of this via this route. Um, I do though hope that universities will recognize that they've created a framework which makes us have to go down this route. And there's a lack of agility in the way universities currently operate, which, you know, in an ideal world, we wouldn't have had to do this. Are you, and I guess that means the CIC, open to taking on software outside of the Biosim community? So, at the beginning, Biosim, just because we want to make, we want to grow. I'm very conservative in the way that I view things. Not conservative in voting, please no. <laughs> but in the way I view things, and I, we're trying to grow at a, at a steady pace, and that's why we sort of have a few projects to begin with, one and a half people. But we do see this growing within the Bison community. I think if we said all open source software, that would be treading on far too many people's toes. But uh, we are open to giving advice to other groups who want to create similar things for their research domain. How hard was it to hire someone in, in the CIC? with all of the, the things that go along with hiring people, managing HR, pensions, holidays? Um, remarkably easy because Edinburgh supplied us with a startup team who basically put us in contact with a company that does all of this for us. And so it's meeting with lawyers, registering for the pension, sorting those out, then negotiating with the employer of what they wanted, but it was all done in partnership. And so actually, yes, it's a lot of admin work, but it's not like it's difficult admin work, it's just painful admin work. And once you've gone through the process, the process has been done. And you, again, Edinburgh have been fantastic. And they paid for the lawyers. And they paid for the people to make sure this. And we were a little like, accountancy company that have done tons of wonderful stuff for us. You mentioned that it was risky, uh, but the financial limit was only one pound. Are there other risks? Yes. So I'd say, for me, the biggest risk was about the RSC and my team. I don't want to make, you know, he has children. He's got a mortgage. You know, I am not going to risk his employment. And so it was about making sure that this started properly and that it was securely funded for at least several years so there was no risk whatsoever to his position. And actually, we've done this with a blended working thing where it's actually still employed by Bristol. So if the whole thing fell down, we could bring him back if needed. And then there's the risk from time and the risk from reputation and all of the effort that went into it. And if this fails, there's an opportunity risk. You know, there's a there's a... So many people have got together to do this that if it fails, it will be difficult to have the opportunity come again. Do you know of any other CICs in the research software area? No, um, but that's probably just because of lack of looking and me being lazy. Um, I'm sure there must be, and of course there are foundations, and we were inspired by some of the foundation models you saw, we saw, but they're too complex for us to set up, and we were mostly inspired by the Society of RSC, which was where we were originally going was a CIO, but then the lawyer said to us, you really don't need to be a CIO. If you're a CIC, your life is easier. And we're very thankful for them for saying that. I think given time, we'll take one last question. 
uh, which is, what did the University of Edinburgh gain from the spin-out of the CIC? What arguments might work in similar cases to motivate a university? So one thing they gained was once the CIC sets up and going, Julian will have part of his salary paid for by the CIC. And that means immediately they're saving money on a professor's salary. And they're able to then have him produce the same research outputs, do the same research, engage in the same collaborations, but they pay him less. So that's good. The other thing that they get is they still get all of the ref output. You know, when you talk about impact and you go to funders and say, look, this is the impact we've had, to say we've created a company that's got all of these pharmaceutical companies really using this software, that's going to be amazing in the next ref. You know, and they talk about that so much. In terms of collaboration, actually the software is the underpinning thing, but most of the collaborations are consultancy for knowledge services on top. So using the software to do a binding assay, and for that, they directly consult with Edinburgh and consult with other universities, and the CIC is providing a route by which they can actually still offer consultancy services. So again, there's lots of ways the university can build reputation and money and have cost saving by going down this route. And remember, the alternative is that they have to again and again and again pay for their, to do bespoke agreements for every single industrial collaboration. So you can sell this as quite a big cost saving plus reputation gain plus future money coming in. So not a question, and we're out of time, but a last comment that just appeared. Ken Soccer, RSE, run a webinar on this, please. So if you would like to discuss this further, we have one last coffee break at the end of the session. So I'm sure Chris will be around yeah. to discuss those things. We've got a short changeover um, for the next thing, which next event, which is the panel. Thank you. Oh, yes. Please thank Chris. <laughs>